So on behalf of the center and the Texas Exes, I want to thank you for joining us for the launch of the Hispanic Leadership Initiative. I would also like to thank AT&T for their generous support of the center in this initiative, and Dr. Jim Henson and the Texas Politics Project for their sponsorship tonight. A little background. Uh, the Center for Politics and Governance, now in its second year, is the nexus of the theoretical and the practical in the teaching of political leadership and the integration of that teaching into the graduate curriculum here at the university. And I, I know that's a mouthful. So uh, in the words of LBJ, we try to create thinkers and doers. And part of our mission is to understand the evolving role of the Hispanic community here in Texas and in the nation and the, what that means for the next generation of leadership. We do this in a number of ways, some of which are described in the brochure you may have received as you walked in the door, but we also wanted to do something much bigger. Here we are, a center at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the flagship university of a state that is rapidly becoming majority Hispanic, that has produced three of the last nine presidents and a disproportionate number of congressional leaders. A state that is home to leaders of national and state policy, law, business, the arts. Many of these leaders also happen to be Hispanic. We would be remiss in not seizing the opportunity to make an impact. And of course, when you want to have a big impact here in Texas, it doesn't, har it doesn't hurt to start with the Texas Exes. And so began our partnership to launch the initiative. And so I want to thank Susana Aleman and the Texas Exes Hispanic Steering Committee for helping us with this tonight. The initiative is a multi-year endeavor to highlight Hispanic leadership and the emerging role of Hispanic Americans in influencing public policy, to recognize outstanding achievements in leadership by Hispanic alumni of the University of Texas, to provide mentoring and networking opportunities for Hispanic alumni and students, to introduce Hispanic undergraduate students to the LBJ School of Public Affairs and their call to public service, and to reconnect Hispanic alumni with the University of Texas on an annual basis. So we begin tonight and we'll build each year with a Hispanic Leadership Summit, a web portal to get information to and about the Hispanic community, analysis of data policy trends and challenges, and outreach to high school students. Someone asked me last week, what makes this different? First, we're taking the approach of a three-legged stool. We're involving alumni, current students, and prospective students. We are asking these leaders at each level, as they look to the future, to also look back at the university, to the schools and communities that they have called home, and to bring forward the next generation of leadership. Second, in keeping with the center's character, this initiative is both about practical applications and academic analysis. With the help of the Texas Politics Project and the Department of Government, we will analyze field data and commission papers from leading academics who will be invited to share their ideas with leaders from a multitude of fields. And we will look to implement these ideas in the complex array of challenges we seek to address. What we like to say at the center is, we go beyond the sound bites, and we intend to do that with Hispanic leadership as well. Finally, and most important, what's different about this initiative is you. All of our good intentions cannot make up for your valuable input and participation. The response to this event has been overwhelming, and I've been very encouraged, not only the response to this event and to all of you who came here tonight, but to the multitude of emails and phone calls we received from people around the state and around the nation who said that although they can't be here tonight, they want to be a part of this leadership initiative and want to help in any way they can. This is your initiative, and it depends upon you for its success. So again, thank you in advance for your help. Thank you all for being here. Tonight is just the beginning, and I invite all of you to continue the discussion and the journey with us. And now it is my great pleasure to turn over the podium to someone who's been a mentor for me personally for many years, and who is also the interim dean and the LBJ Centennial Chair in National Policy at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, Please help me welcome Admiral Bob Inman. With her characteristic modesty, what Ronnie didn't tell you 
is that her initial tie with the Texas X's was being selected to be a Texas Excellence Scholar, our premier scholarship program. And I had the privilege of sitting on the panel that selected Ronnie. So, so I've tracked her for a long time. And uh, her success continues to simply dazzle me. Um, when she came back from Washington, I suggested to Jim Steinberg that he ought to consider trying to find a role for her. He leaped way beyond uh, where my own vision was to give her the charge of being the first director full time for the Center for Politics and Governance. As I've reflected on this initiative, Ronnie, my question is, why didn't we do this 20 years ago? It was clear 20 years ago the demographic changes, um, what was going to be happening, uh, the natural evolution uh, simply from numbers and hopefully from education and talent for growing numbers of Hispanics who would play an increasingly important role not just in the community and in the county and the state, in the nation. Um, I think because we didn't start 20 years ago, uh, we failed to help develop leaders uh, that are so desperately needed in these times. So better now than never in the process. Uh, we don't tell you at the outset that we have the exact prescription of what this initiative should do. We are very open for advice, challenges, thoughts on how we might improve it. Uh, and I would note that the Center for Politics and Governance, in the words of the late Elspeth Rostow, fills the missing part in the mission of the school uh, that was not put in place when the school started. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, including fundraising. And there's a wonderful naming opportunity for the Center for Politics and Governance. <laughs> uh, we only need about a $10 million endowment to really ensure that we get it in the mode uh, that it needs to be in. So if you know anybody who might like to join and have their name attached to it, uh, not only would we be forever grateful, but it would be a wonderful way to be remembered through history for helping shape the leaders of what will be the majority, certainly in this state, probably in California, many other parts of the country. Um, it's my particular privilege uh, to introduce the keynote speaker. I spoke of the need for leadership. We're already seeing the leadership emerge in politics. Uh, we're seeing it increasingly in the professions. I would argue that the most desperate need was in higher education. Our wonderful, wonderful privilege of having Dr. Sigaroa where he is now. He says, he didn't need this job. Uh, Yale undergraduate will forgive. U <laughs> UT Southwestern for medical school established his great talent early uh, pediatrician, but then a transplant, the most critical element for having a five-month-old grandson who recently went through a heart operation. Uh, I'm particularly sensitive to how important this talent is. But then he also moved to take up some administrative challenges. He'd been at the Health Science Center in San Antonio for several years. And when asked, he rose to the occasion of guiding it. And did that for eight and a half years, almost nine years. And then he announced he wanted to go back to the operating room. But when called, he agreed to take on the leadership of one of the country's largest educational institutions. At a time when um, we're feeling so many different stresses, 
changing nature of the population. How do we, in fact, serve the burgeoning population of the state? Um, in flat to sometimes declining revenue support from the state. We've been fortunate that philanthropists have stepped in to help fill the void, but that void's getting larger uh, even as we go forward. So it's a daunting challenge to further public service for one who'd already done his turn. And we're so grateful, Dr. Siguro, you were willing to do it yet once more. Please help me welcome our chancellor. Admiral Lindman, thank you so much for those kind words. And what a privilege it is to be before the UT Exes. Uh, because the University of Texas has given so much to my family, it's given so much to me, and it's given so much to so many others in our great state, our nation, and our world. I'm really honored to be here. The LBJ School is one of the premier public affairs programs in the nation, and the Center for Politics and Government has won a justified reputation for excellence. The Hispanic Leadership Initiative being undertaken by the Center in partnership with the Texas Exes is a true public service to our state and to this great nation. I'm certain that you're aware the Hispanic population will soon be a majority, not only in the state of Texas, but in our nation. It is appropriate that we should focus our attention not only on highlighting the success of Hispanics, but more importantly, on nurturing the talents and the aspirations of young Hispanics who will soon take their rightful place as leaders at every level of governance and public service. These young people stand on the strong foundation of courageous men and women who worked over generations to advance the cause of equal participation and responsibility. And we now stand at the threshold of the realizations of those dreams. We share the obligation to usher in this new era in a way that makes all of Texas grateful for its arrival. Our greatest obstacle in meeting this challenge is still the incomplete achievement of educational benchmarks in our society. A complete education an education built at the intersection of knowledge and action. An education that harnesses the great lessons of science, the great lessons of literacy, or literature, history, and art is the greatest gift that we can give our children. And it is the bedrock on which great leadership is built. The poet Robert Frost wrote verse through such a rich intersection of disciplines you can glean this in a lecture Frost delivered on October the 26th of 1937 when he delved into what discipline, if any, was closest to poetry. The great poet found at first glance that it was science. Frost said science might be nearer to poetry than most because it is nothing if it is not achievement, if it is not creative. Frost also found it akin to poetry and philosophy because this subject fosters flashes of light. He found it in athletics because poetry stirs words into motion. And in the English department, who are keepers of the text. If these various disciplines had not intersected in his own education, one questions whether his beautiful verses might ever have been written. Can you imagine a world without his lines from the road not taken? Listen to Frost's words. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took them one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. Well, what an immeasurable loss it would have been for us if we did not have this verse to turn to today when pondering our life's choices. 
It is really an unsettling thought that Robert Frost might not have committed them to paper if he had not been blessed with the strong multidisciplinary education he received. One's education foundation is that important and unfortunately today it is at risk for the present and future generations. The disciplines, art, science, philosophy, literature, mathematics, really required for an integration of brilliance not only in literature but in all fields, are sometimes not a consistent fabric of many American students' academic backgrounds. Our educational system is not where it needs to be and in fact is really more strained than ever. Our challenges in education, and particularly in the education of underrepresented minority students, has been called a gathering storm. Indeed, it suggests a wash of ignorance and a lack of preparation, sometimes compared not unlike Hurricane Ike, as an increase in size and its tides rose to unprecedented heights really before engulfing our Gulf Coast. Well, tomorrow's revered leaders that might have been are in jeopardy while we tinker around the margins of the concerted effort needed to save them. Well, let me provide some evidence, starting with a number of baccalaureate degrees that are being lost, based on a study entitled Mortgaging Our Future. During the 1990s, between nearly 1 million and 1.6 million baccalaureate degrees were lost among college-qualified high school graduates from low and moderate income families. And during the current decade, between 1.4 and 2.4 million more baccalaureate degrees will likely be lost. These estimates are extremely conservative. The numbers exclude students who either did not graduate from high school or graduated but are not college qualified. So imagine, as best that you can, the students' faces behind these staggering numbers and statistics mean absolutely nothing if you do not envision and personalize what they mean. Think of the opportunities that have been missed in the numbers of young people gone astray or visualize the lives that could have changed, the ideas and the innovations that could have been produced in these individuals if these individuals graduated from college. Now listen to these disturbing statistics. In the United States, only 71% of entering ninth graders graduate from high school. Only 39% enter college and only 18% graduate within a six-year time frame. That is only 18 out of 100 ninth graders, in other words, graduate from college within six years in really a society that is so knowledge-based today. And this problem only worsens for students who are raised through no fault of their own in low socioeconomic environments, many of whom are underrepresented minorities. And this is the population which is exponentially growing over the next decade in our nation. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, minority students will compose a majority of students nationwide, increasing to 54% by 2050. Well, with these statistics, these unsettling statistics affecting not only minorities, but every American, the Frosts, or even the humble Francisco Cigarros of the world, might not have made it at present. The odds would have been overwhelmingly against my being your speaker today as a Hispanic, educated through public schools, from a small Texas border city. Given this scenario, in fact, it is not an exaggeration to state that only a small percentage of you might be occupying your seats right now if you had gone through many of the strained public educational systems as they exist today. That we are losing a competitive student pipeline is only one element of the storm. Not only is the strain that I mentioned apparent in the public schools and at the undergraduate level, but it is showing itself in graduate schools in our capacity to research, innovate, and transition our innovations into the commercial marketplace. Some are forgetting the prophetic words of Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve. He said, quote, if we are to remain the preem preeminent in transforming knowledge into economic value, the U.S. system of higher education must remain the world leader in generating scientific and technological breakthroughs and in preparing workers to meet the evolving demand of skilled labor. In this instance, Greenspan was wise. He concluded towards the end of his career as chairman, if you can solve the education problem, you do not have to do 
anything else. If you don't solve it, nothing else is going to matter all that much. The voices expressing concern over the weakening of our global competitiveness and the decline of our educational systems are many, but unfortunately the response has been slow. The data, again, are compelling. American 12th graders scored near the bottom on the recent third international math and science study. U.S. students placed 19th out of 21 developed nations in math and 16 out of 21 in science. And interestingly, our fourth grade students performed as well in mathematics and science as do their peers in other nations. However, in a recent assessment, 12th graders were almost last among students who participated in the trends in international mathematics and science study. So it becomes apparent that our students are facing adverse educational circumstances in our middle and our high schools. Our nation faces several areas of challenge, K through 12 student preparation in mathematics and science, limited undergraduate interest in science and engineering majors, and a significant student attrition among science and engineering undergraduate and graduate students. This scenario, of course, we can do something about it. That is the spirit of Texas. It's the spirit of the University of Texas system at large. Now, by sharing the blueprint of my career, I would like to basically give you some unique insights into what we are finding is working to ensure that we prevent this hardship in the educational opportunities for our younger generation. First of all, I'm proud that I went through the public school systems in Laredo, Texas, which when I was growing up was a small, dusty city ranked among the poorest cities in the United States with among one of the poorest public school systems in the United States. But I can tell you that in that environment, I can still recall every teacher from first grade through high school. This was at a time long before the state required standardized tests to measure achievement requiring rote preparation. And when I was in high school, the teachers instilled in students a tremendous love of learning. Again, the power, the mentorship of outstanding teachers in our society. They were not teaching to a test, they were teaching to instill a love of learning that would motivate us for a lifetime. Secondly, growing along the Texas-Mexico border in Laredo as the son of a physician, my father being Dr. Joaquin Cigarroa, also provided me with a tremendous experience in understanding the challenges faced by a medically underserved region resulting in significant healthcare disparities, many of which are now looming public health issues not only for Texas, but for the entire nation. Now just as growing up in Laredo gave me a roadmap of what works on the border in terms of education and the delivery of healthcare, pediatric surgery, transplantation surgery was the ideal background for leading an academic health center because it did expose me to one of the most demanding surgical fellowships in the world under the mentorship of outstanding clinical scientists. My surgical training provided a very strong foundation that I continually rely on administrative leadership. I learned that a surgeon needs to lead to be decisive and to inspire a team of professionals to do their very best. And furthermore, a leader in surgery must hold himself or herself along with members of the team accountable when an unexpected patient outcome is not achieved. We share a strong desire to continually want to improve in our profession through lifelong learning. And that is something that universities teach our students. In essence, these are the traits that are critical in leading a health science center and leading a university system. So in summation, every step of my collective educational life experiences provided me with the, att the attributes necessary to lead a university system with academic and health institutions and to acquire the trust of faculty, students, and staff in carrying out the mission, the most important mission of the University of Texas system. It was not an intentional design, it was simply how my life unfolded and brought me to this place 
that I stand before you. None of us can transfer the benefits and the experiences that came from our families to young people coming along now, but we certainly can make educational opportunities and resultant experiences equal to our own available to the next generation. I may add, that is probably the most important responsibility that we have. And that is what we are working very hard to do at the University of Texas system. We understand that our success in fulfilling our core missions of education, research, healthcare, and service is not dependent exclusively on how well we prepare our students after they come to us. Excellence in education is now, at minimum, measured on our work in a paradigm of making K through 16 education seamless. We are truly part of a complex, interdependent educational system that begins its responsibility to students long before they ever set foot on our universities. And we take that responsibility profoundly seriously. The UT system is taking a leadership role in improving K through 16 initiatives and we will accept nothing than excellence, nothing less than leadership on all fronts. We have instituted or established the Institute for Public School Initiatives, which exists with one priority only, to help teachers improve their skills and instill in their students that love of learning that was so important to me. One of the proudest accomplishments on any of our campuses is the creation of the U Teach program, originated by Dean Mary Ann Rankin of the College of Natural Sciences here at UT Austin. Through this program, outstanding students are encouraged to enter teaching as a career and then train to be a kind of science teachers that inspire and interest all other students. And this wonderful program has spread to other departments and colleges and is now regarded as a national model for teacher preparation. Again, what an important responsibility our universities have to basically prepare the finest teachers that we can possibly graduate to teach our Texas children. Our community college initiative is built on the understanding that all levels of post-secondary education must work together if we are to achieve the important goals of the coordinating boards closing the gaps. It is designed to encourage and ease the transition from community colleges to our four-year universities and to assure college success. We're also working diligently to improve our academic support services and outreach programs to improve student representation and success. And we are redoubling our efforts to increase the availability of scholarships to ensure that no qualified student is, designed, is denied an education as a result of socioeconomic reasons. I, of course, am particularly proud of the development and constant improvements of health professional education in South Texas. This is one of my first, my, one of my most important priorities as president of the UT Health Science in San Antonio. And it pays multiple dividends by helping students enter a profession and improve the availability of health care in chronically underserved regions. And since 2003, the Joint Admissions Medical Program, or JAMP, has been helping Texas students achieve their dreams with guaranteed admission to one of the state's eight medical schools and financial and academic support to help them get there and ensure that they excel. I am really proud of the University of Texas system in taking bold initiatives to overcome the challenges uh, that we face in our educational systems in America. It is our responsibility to lead on these fronts. These are programs that help students who might have been lost to find their way and to expose them to the kind of experiences that most of us have had, experiences that open doors to the future. Without these experiences, I would not have had the choices so beautifully described by Robert Frost as two diverging roads, which for me came as a decision whether to practice medicine exclusively as a pediatric and transplant surgeon or to lead an academic health science center as its president and then the University of Texas system as its chancellor. As Admiral Inman stated in October, I faced two diverging roads again in my life. But the responsibility of becoming chancellor uh, was a higher calling for public service. And I fundamentally believe that education saves lives. The fact that I had a choice to begin with between pursuing two paths 
that led in radically different ways to practicing the beautiful art of medicine has really made all the difference in my life. I really learned so much about myself, about leadership, about making a difference, not only in individual lives, but in the future of Texas, in the future of our nation and world. As Sandra Day O'Connor, former US, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, who was just recently here this past week, so beautifully expressed, in order to cultivate a set of leaders with legitimacy in the eyes of the citizenry, it is necessary that the path to leadership be visibly open to talented and qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity. All members of our heterogeneous society must have confidence in the openness and in the integrity of the educational institutions that provide this training. So let us ensure that incredible choices and junctures are open for future generations through the choices that we are making in public service. These choices have to do with which students we are reaching out to, which federal and state policies we may choose to become involved with, and ways to buttress our educational system in whatever manner we can in order to achieve a diverse, talented student pool from elementary school all the way through graduate education. People prosper or fail, careers are developed or lost, depending on what we choose to do, what path we choose to take. We can no longer risk complacency as we face a looming storm that is nothing short of a public health crisis. We can no longer risk not deciding on which road to take or the consolation of success in our own individual lives. So I submit that we must ensure that the student pipeline remains wonderfully competitive, diverse, open, and bountiful. To ensure that our students from kindergarten through college pursue knowledge through a deep love of learning, which can cross disciplines in creativity and flashes of brilliance. And also to ensure that our educational institutions become conduits to serving the greater good. This moment in history demands such a collective effort in the spirit of what is best for our state and what is best for our society. Let us choose to seize the moment and follow inspired decisions to their realization. This will make a world of difference for the next generation and generations to come. Admiral Inman, I thank you very much for allowing me to speak before this distinguished group and um, it's such a privilege to be here. I'm gonna complete my role in this by inviting the other members of the panel to come up and join the conversation. But again, I'd like to say, well, thank you so much for the keynote and getting us off to a great start. How, how are you? You've been up to my party? Well, all good. Thank you, Admiral. We'll miss you, miss you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sigaroa. And uh, thank notes? you to the distinguished panel we've gathered here today. I'm going to read briefly their full biographies are in the program. Their many accomplishments and achievements are too many to list here, but I will give you brief introductions. Many of, uh, many of you probably know all of them. So uh, let's begin money. with Congressman Henry Bonilla, who was a member of the United States Congress from 1993 to 2007. In his first term of office, Mr. Bonilla quickly made his mark. He was featured by Time Magazine as one of America's top 50 up and coming young leaders. And more importantly, that same year, he was recognized as an outstanding young Texas ex. He was also presented an award for dedicated leadership and distinguished service by UT President Robert M. Berdahl in 1996. During his time on Capitol Hill, Congressman Bernier rose to become the seventh most influential member of Congress in the power rankings by Congress.org. His <coughs> impact on Hispanic voters was historic. He represented a congressional district that spanned hundreds of miles along the Texas-Mexico border. The population was overwhelmingly Hispanic and had never before been represented by a Republican. He also became a national political leader and co-chaired the Republican National Conventions in 2000 and 2004. He is now a partner with the Normandy Group. 
Also joining us on the panel is Ted Cruz, who served as Solicitor General from 2003 to 2008, representing Texas before the U.S. Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court, and state and federal appellate courts. He was the first Hispanic Solicitor General in Texas, the youngest Solicitor General in the nation, and the longest serving Solicitor General in the state. Ted has been named by American Lawyer Magazine as one of the 50 best litigators under 45 in America. He's been hailed as a rising star in the Wall Street Journal and named by National Law Journal as one of the most, as one of the 50 most influential minority lawyers in America. He's held positions in the Federal Trade Commission, the U.S. Department of Justice, and served as a policy advisor to President George W. Bush. He also served as a law, a law clerk to Chief Justice William Rehnquist and has the distinction of being the only Hispanic in history to have clerked for the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Cruz is a partner at Morgan Lewis and Bacchus LLP and he also serves as an adjunct professor of law at the University of Texas Law School. And on to the right of Mr. Cruz is Judge Orlinda Naranjo, who was elected to Travis County, uh, the 419th District Court, in November 2006 for a four-year term. She also served as Judge of County Court of Law Number 2 for 12 years, having been elected to that bench in 1994. She was appointed to the Texas Judicial Council from May 2000 to September 2008, by Chief Justice Tom Phillips and reappointed by Chief Justice Wallace Jefferson from September 2008 to present. From January 2002 to 2008, she was appointed by Governor Rick Perry to serve as a member of the Task Force on Indigent, indigent Defense, a standing statewide 13-member committee that improves the delivery of indigent defense services. She's a community advisor for the Junior League of Austin, an alumni of Leadership Texas and Leadership Austin, and an officer and former board member of numerous professional and community organizations. And finally, last but not least, we welcome Representative Pete Gallego, who rushed over here from uh, an adjourned uh, house. He is a member of the Texas House of Representatives from District 74, the largest house district and the largest Texas US Mexico border district, which stretches nearly 39,000 square miles and containing over half of the Texas Mexico border. Elected in 1990, Representative Gallego is the first Hispanic to represent this vast border district. In 1991, he became the first freshman member and the first ethnic minority member ever elected as chair of the House Democratic Caucus, a post he held until January of 2001. In January 2001, Representative Gallego was unanimously elected by his colleagues to serve as chair of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus. Following the 1999 session, he was selected as one of Texas Monthly's 10 best legislators. He's also been honored by the Texas State University System, the University of Texas System, and the independent colleges and University of Texas in appreciation for his support of higher education. He's also currently of counsel to the law firm of Brown McCarroll. So please join me in welcoming all of these distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and just jump right into the discussion. And so Congressman Benny, I'm gonna begin with you. In 1977, Thanks. the Office of Management and Budget issued Directive 15, which uh, which set out race and ethnic standards for federal statistics and administrative reporting. It is the first, it is acknowledged as the first uh, issuance of the label Hispanic. It's the, in terms of government usage. It defined Hispanic as a person of Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Central or South American, or other Spanish cultural origin, regardless of race. So in some ways, it's a relatively recent term, and in other ways, it's, a, it's an outdated and an old term. So my question to you and to the rest of the panel is, what does it mean to be Hispanic in the 21st century United States? Well, it is not as clearly defined as it was maybe a generation ago because there has been so many uh, intermixing and families, in some cases even a couple of generations have gone by where perhaps a, an Anglo or an African American may have married into a Hispanic family that may have been from Mexico or Central or South America, but then someone else in the family may have uh, hooked up with someone else from the Cuban American community. <laughs> and so uh, you know, some of the stories that you hear now about the incredible diversity within the Hispanic culture is something that we hadn't seen uh, emerge before in our, in our demographics in this country. So it is not, it's not an easy answer. But I think the government, as, as are most entities, is doing the best job it can to try to keep track of everyone to see how we all fit together. And if I can elaborate just a minute, the, uh, I compare the uh, potential Hispanic impact on this country to the impact 
that the high tech boom had on America back in the mid 90s. In a good way, in a positive way, it changed our country and to a great degree changed the world. And that is what the Hispanic culture is, is now having. We're living through this historic trend right now in what kind of impact the Hispanic culture is having, not just on our country, but on, on, on cultures across the world. But again, in breaking down the uh, Hispanic culture, the, the, the largest population by far over half comes from the, the geographic area of Mexico, Central America, South, and South America, and on down. Uh, versus the Puerto Rican community versus the Cuban American community. But again, at some point, they're all going to meet at the same place and, and create a new America. And that's why I say in a positive way, it does compare to what we saw in the high tech industry in the 90s. And when we look back on this era, we are all going to say we lived through it. And uh, so we should all embrace it. And it gets complicated. And, and one more point. Uh, as I finish this comment, and we all embrace, should embrace and study and be part of how all of the other factors affect this emerging uh, demographic factor in our country. Free trade with Panama, with Cuba, with Central America, those potential packs that are out there now. You know, the drug cartels that are impacting immigration sometimes uh, in some cases. Uh, comprehensive immigration reform, new trade with Cuba that's emerging now. The doors are opening to that community, and it's somewhat controversial. But all of these things are, are, are what we, as part of the University of Texas, should embrace and, and be part of. It's an exciting time. And I just appreciate, again, that you all gave me an opportunity to be here with you tonight. Ted. Thank you, Congressman. And thank you very much for having us here and for putting this event together. This is a, a fantastic event, and I congratulate you and the center on this terrific launch. Uh, I very much agree with, with Congressman Bonilla's observations. I think that, that while there are certainly differences uh, in terms of national origin of where various people come from, uh, I think the terms Hispanic or Latino still convey a great deal of content because I think there is far more that unites the Hispanic community than there is that separates it. Uh, I think if you look across cultures in the Hispanic community, you see number one, uh, a, a deep love of family, strong families. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, how many of us uh, had an abuela that had a chancleta that she could throw and hit you across the room with? <laughs> Uh, you know, that's something that, that, that all of us can relate to because it's, it's who we are. It's part of who, who we grew up. Um, faith, I think, is an incredibly important factor in, in the Hispanic and Latino community uh, in terms of all of us raised of the importance of faith and family and the two working together. I think patriotism is something I think as Hispanics we are deeply patriotic and, and love this country. And, and I think that is very much part of who we are. And, and I think the aspect that most ties together Hispanics is that we are all a product of immigrants, whether it is ourselves or our parents or our great-great-grandparents. Somebody was crazy enough to leave everything, to leave safety and security of their home and to come here in pursuit of freedom. And I think that passion for opportunity, that passion for the American dream, to my mind, is the single most potent value that unifies the Hispanic community, that we were all raised in families that are here because our parents, our grandparents, all of our family wants to participate and contribute to the American dream. Just Naranjo? People have been asking me, what happened to my left hand? And it's, it's using the gavel. No, that's not what <laughs> <laughs> It's tendonitis. But I also want to thank uh, everyone that is involved with the launching of this initiative uh, and the opportunity to be here today. When I think of what does it mean to be Hispanic, I'll always remember you know, some of the issues that probably we all personally can share. I remember people looking at me and saying, you're not Hispanic, you're Americana, you're a gringa, you're, you know, and because I was light-skinned, maybe because I had blue eyes and I was a güerita, you know, so there were the, the, so there were those issues that probably 
we deal with that we have some biases even amongst ourselves. But the reality is, is that, that we are all Hispanic or Latinos or whatever you prefer to call, but we all have a label, if we want to use a label, that connects us. We all have, as Ted just said, a passion for our families, a passion for our communities, and I believe a, co a commitment to our communities. And I think that that really is what separates us. If I think of the, if I think when we're starting to look at different cultures or different races, I think one of the biggest differences, we still connect with our families. We don't forget about our abuelitos. We don't forget about our primos. I have two nieces and my, my husband keeps telling me, how many of your family are gonna live with us? You know, because they, you know, because they come in because they need. They need a mentor, they need some assistance and they need some help. And we are there for our family as we are there for our community. And I think that that is something important that we're seeing here tonight. And that is how do we reach out to our youth, because they are the future. And, and that, that sounds cliche because we hear it so much, but they truly are. And education is really the key, and I think all of us will agree is the key to the opportunities that we have had. And so it is so important for each and every one of us to commit to that. And that's why you're here and why we are all here, because we are committed to that fundamental opportunity and that is education for our children, for our grandchildren, and for their grandchildren. Uh, and so I reach back, and I do reach out to my nieces, and I see them struggling at, at you know, dropping out of high school and saying, you know, the only way you're going to get ahead is education. Come live with me, and I'm going to, you know, we'll get you the GED, then we'll get you into ACC, and then maybe UT, uh, because that's what we do. We reach out. We give, we hold each other's hands, and we hold each other up. And so that, that's what I think is so fundamentally and culturally unique to our Hispanic Latino culture. Well, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different tack because I, uh, I will tell you that from my view, um, Hispanics have always been a mix. It's always been, whether it was Spanish, and uh, uh, Aztec or Mayan or Incan, it's always been a mixture. There is no more mixing, in my view, really today uh, in terms of the Hispanics than there has been throughout history. But for me, the big difference today is that for the first time in my life, our opinions matter. For the first time in my life, what it means to be an Hispanic is, if you've ever wondered what it feels like to win the lottery and how all of a sudden everybody wants to be your friend, um, <laughs> That's essentially what it's like, um, certainly in the political world today, because all of a sudden, for the first time, everybody wonders about the Hispanic electorate, uh, how Hispanics are going to vote, what Hispanics are going to do, will, support, will Hispanics support an African-American candidate, will Hispanics, all of these questions. So for the first time, being Hispanic is important, and our opinions matter. And that's a tremendous difference from the past. One of the big issues of the day where it's also important is it, this is probably also the most controversial time to be an Hispanic. And it's controversial in several senses. When I was a kid growing up in a somewhat segregated city in far west Texas, Hispanics you were taught um, essentially not to rock the boat very much. People <coughs> were afraid um, to rock the boat. Um, that's not so much the case anymore in so many places, but what is rocking the boat is our sheer numbers. Because now you see, for the first time, a backlash against Hispanics, and that's, to me, the whole immigration debate. Some of us are recent arrivals, and some of us are not. Somewhere in the back, my little four-year-old, Nicolás, is hanging out. Nicolás, on his mother's side, is a 10th generation Texan, and if you count back 10th generations, you'll find that that's She's, it's, his mother is from a land-grant family, so you'd find that was before Texas or the U.S. was even around. Um, I get letters because there's a picture of me and, uh, and my son in some newspaper, and I'll get a letter saying that I should take my son and go back to Mexico where we both belong, which is interesting to me because I can assure you that the person who wrote me that letter hadn't been around for 10 generations. Um, so 
It is a, a controversial time uh, to be an Hispanic, but it is a fundamentally challenging and wonderful time uh, to be an Hispanic because as we use this term uh, come of age, as we come to a part, uh, a point in history where our decisions are mainstream and are going to matter and are going to shape the future of our country, it's all the more exciting for those of you who are younger uh, than I am who have an opportunity, I think, to, to start and build and fix and make better for a much longer time than those of us who are at the table who have been in public service for some time. It's all the more exciting for somebody like Nicolás, who is four years old, because what a country he's going to live in by the time he turns 21 or 30 or 40 or 50 uh, with the numbers of Latinos that are here and the opportunities that he will have. My, on my side of the family, my grandparents met as migrant workers on a field in Colorado City. So if you had asked my abuelo about having a son who'd be in the, or a grandson who'd be in the Texas House of Representatives, he would have laughed. Um, and it's just an amazing thing. But if you think of the progress that, that Latinos, Hispanics, whatever you want to call them, have made over the last couple of generations, and you realize that just by sheer force of gravity, by sheer force of numbers, that grows exponentially every two years then you will think of the progress that will be made between our generation and our grandkids' generation, which is going to be just that much more uh, phenomenal than the progress that we've seen. What it means uh, is to be controversial, uh, but uh, what it means is to be in the driver's seat, um, to have an opinion that people are interested in, to have an opinion that matters, um, and really to be able to take part for the first time uh, in a very real way in the discourse of uh, not only where our state is going, um, but just as importantly where we're going um, as a nation and to be able to plot that course. We have a lot of um, um, values, I think, that we share as a community. Uh, but we also um, have one other thing that um, I think uh, we need to, um, to acknowledge, and that is we're survivors. We have survived some incredible challenges over the course of our history. And through it all, we've managed to not only survive, but we've actually even prospered. And I think that really bodes well uh, for the future. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I want to get to some of those political issues. Today, but first, I want to pick up the statement about the analogy between uh, the growth of the Hispanic population and the tech boom. And so Chancellor, I was wondering if you can think of lessons learned from the tech boom for us to avoid the bust. If, it's, if the analogy holds true, um, what are the things that we should be cautious about or what are the challenges we're going to face so we make sure that it's a positive, a net positive, rather than uh, having a little setback here and there? Well, really, um, again, touching upon just the changing demographics, um, the, the most important, uh, from, from my perspective, responsibility that we have is really giving the opportunity to make sure that every child in Texas in this nation understands that they are capable of receiving an outstanding education. And if Hispanics are going to be the majority uh, in this nation because of demographic changes, if we're not actually fundamentally solving the fact uh, that only 18 percent of high school graduates are receiving a baccalaureate degree, um, then there are going to be hardships. And in order for us to be able to provide um, leadership, uh, not only in governance, but in, in faculty positions, in administrative leaderships across universities in America, it's so important that we inculcate in our culture the importance of education. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when Joe talks, everybody listens. <laughs> well, Joe, I was just. Uh, you, the, the question was about, you know, what can we do to pre prevent a boom or a bust? And I go back to my fundamental argument uh, that, in fact, if only 18 percent of ninth graders are ultimately getting a baccalaureate degree six years after they graduate from high school, if we don't make real progress on that front, then how are we going to improve the diversity across leadership in America, across faculty and administrative leaders in our universities? Uh, I'm so proud that I've been given these opportunities, uh, but I'm not satisfied with that. 
it's important that we, that we are able to provide those opportunities uh, to any child who has the focus, the commitment, and the capabilities of wanting to pursue a higher education that we as a society have to be able to make those doors become open. And if we are uh, going to become the majority of this nation, we have to be able to fix that problem. And that's why, even as a chancellor, I'm very involved with what's going on in our K-12 uh, public school systems in America. Well, let's talk a little bit about what Representative Gallego was talking about, which is the opinion of Hispanics suddenly mattering. And let's try and draw the distinction between, is this hype? or is this uh, something real that, that's occurring? Fifteen years ago, conventional political wisdom was that a Hispanic would be president before either an African American or a woman. And in both 2006 and 2008, uh, the Hispanic community was uh, supposed to make the difference uh, in those elections. And so my question to this panel, uh, four out of five who are, uh, have been or are seeking uh, elected office. Is the sleeping giant a myth? Is that something that uh, we're going to continue to hear about or something that we're actually going to see realized? And is there uh, ever going to be a realization of that potential of political power? So, Congressman Vanilla? I think uh, Pete Gallego was correct in the impact that Hispanics are now having on the political community and on the economy and so forth, there is a real possibility that a Hispanic could be elected, uh, the next president, but that leader must emerge. And you never know where they're going to come from. And, this, and you know, President Obama, uh, a year before he got the nomination, was not even on the, on the Democratic radar screen. Everyone thought, for example, that Hillary Clinton was going to walk away with it. Of course, history changed. But he emerged as a strong leader and as a communicator and a visionary. And he got people to follow him. Leaders cannot be created from the bottom up. There has, there's someone out there in some state, in some neighborhood that came from some barrio, perhaps like those that all of us grew up in, that has to emerge. And if that person does come forward, I think that they will have now, in this day and age, uh, as much of an opportunity as anyone else to be president. And one more comment I wanted to make on Ronnie's earlier question about preventing us from being a bust as a demographic group in the future. I think it's incumbent for all of us to be leaders in our families and our communities. We know, I was born in a housing project. I grew up in a 98% Hispanic community in a poor part of San Antonio. So I understand exactly what goes on in the neighborhoods. My parents, I, my mother and father, were, or my father, I lost him, my mother's still around, wonderful parents. But they never encouraged me to go to college. They never encouraged me to go off and, and live my dream. My mother would have been happy if I had gotten married right out of high school and lived in the back room and everything would have been fine. We owe it upon, uh, to our future generations to say, hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do, but the sky is now the limit. There are stories in the Hispanic community that are still out there where parents will not allow their child to go to MIT on a scholarship because they don't want Mija to leave home. So let us not fall into that trap. Let us blow through that so that our our uh, culture can boom, continue to boom, because I have often said that the, the greatest, the, uh, do not fear as adversaries your enemies. It will always be either yourself, your family, or your friends that'll do you in first. <laughs> and we should always all take that to heart in terms of helping our family and helping our friends emerge as Hispanic leaders. Congressman, I have to add that that's what they teach you in baby judge school. It's your, it's your family or, uh, that's going to bring down your career. Uh, so that's what they teach you in baby judge school, and that it's your family that's going, that could uh, demolish your career, not necessarily yourself. John, John Bernie in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, if I can just uh, interject here. Uh, we go back to, uh, and, uh, and it's what the Chancellor has been saying, it is incumbent upon us to make sure that our children 
Our children are given opportunities. Let me just share a little bit about me. I am from Española, New Mexico. I'm, I'm number six rough or seven. Place. Yeah, rough place. Uh, six or seven children. Uh, my father had an eighth grade a sixth grade education. My mother had an eighth grade education. And, and, and my mother worked as a, a maid. That's how she made her living. And, as, and then a cook. Uh, at a, at a high, uh, grade school, and my father was a heavy equipment operator. My father died when I was 15. And so I look back and I think of the, the many, many obstacles that I had to overcome to get where I am today. I also am a, was a teen parent, so that's another issue. And so I look back at the issues, that, and those issues and challenges are still there for our, for our our culture, we look at the Hispanic population. We, are, we have the notoriety of being the first in the, in the country that our teen parents have had a second child as teenagers. We have that notoriety. We look at uh, uh, children. Uh, we have one of the, you know, not as high as African Americans, but we still have a high high school dropout rate. Uh, we still have a very high rate of our, of our prison population, our minorities, Hispanics. So those are the issues, and we go back, how do we keep them, as a judge, how do we keep them from making these mistakes? I had a young woman the other day who I was uh, presiding over a parental termination case, five children, and she was 22 years old. Five children, but she really believed that the fifth child that she had with this 17 year old boy, this 17 year old boy was going to step up to the plate and take care of the five children. He was gone after she was three or four months pregnant. And, and all of the issues and obstacles that that one mother had to try to overcome to keep her children and to keep them safe, provide a home, and everything else for them. Those are the issues that we as a society deal with, but when we look at what is the fundamental problem, if, if we can help these kids stay in school, realize the importance, and I, I talk, and you're absolutely right, we, each and every one of us, have to make a commitment that we as leaders can, can go in and provide mentorship, can go in and provide that this is what you can overcome if you have a focus and a dream of education, and education, again, is the key to the opportunities that you will have. I tell them, without education, I couldn't be where I am today. I would, you know, when we talk about, the, there's many issues that we can talk about, but when we talk about how do we, how do we address some of these issues, it has to start at kindergarten and grade school and, high, and middle school. Where we keep the kids focused on the importance of education, the importance of, that they can become somebody, that they can become a judge, a representative, a chancellor, a congressman, the U.S. congressman, that they can do it. And they can, they can think about it, they can dream about it. If they look up and they can see that there are examples in their community, that there are leaders that look like them, maybe have had the same experiences. I try, when I go in and talk to people, I don't talk about how, what sets me apart from them. I try to talk to them about how, what we have in common. Because they look at me and they don't think, do I look like a judge when I walk into the, court, into the room? They say, well, no, not really. I, what, well, what does a judge look like? Well, I was kind of thinking like of a, Maybe a really old white man is usually what they tell me. That's usually what they tell me. And so it's, uh, so, you know, I don't look like what they like expect. But if I put my robe on and I sit on the, on the bench, then okay, you look like a judge now. You know, so I, I'm just saying that a lot of times if we share what we have in common with these, with these kids, what we have, you know, that maybe they also lost a parent that maybe they were raised by, uh, by a single parent. And you show them the commonalities, then you also can show them that even with those commonalities, you can be successful. But the key is education, and we have to start at a very early age.
So it's, Ted, is the greatest, are the greatest obstacles posed from within the community or from without? Well, I think both. I mean, I think at, a, at an outset, I'll, I'll point out that all of us, we, we have some good news and some bad news. Uh, we've learned from Representative Gallego that all of us have won the lottery. <laughs> uh, so that's nice. But, but Congressman Bonilla told us when we get home, our friend and family is going to steal the lottery ticket. <laughs> so we've, we've got uh, they will. sunshine and trouble. <laughs> Um, you know, I think the question of the role of the Hispanic community in politics is one that is, is very much still being written. Um, I, I think there is no doubt that right now both parties are actively focusing on the Hispanic community. Now, I also think both political parties are pretty lousy at actually connecting and speaking to Hispanics. Um, so they're talking about it, they're trying, they're kind of, you know, pawing around not very effectively. Um, but I do think right now both political parties realize that our demographic growth is becoming impossible to ignore. Uh, one of the things that I think is incredibly, uh, it, and if you look at this last election, I mean, you asked uh, about the sleeping giant, is it still sleeping? One of the most marked differences in this last election is how the Hispanic community voted. In 2004, George W. Bush got between 40 and 44 percent of the Hispanic vote nationwide. In 2008, John McCain barely got 31 percent. That's a third of the vote. Hispanics and young people are the two most dramatic shifts in this last election cycle of a voting group that changed party allegiance in this last election cycle. Uh, now, one thing that I think is very, very healthy for our community is that right now, at least, Hispanics are not lumped automatically into either party. Uh, and I think that is probably a very healthy thing. I remember when I was in law school, uh, we were creating the uh, Harvard Latino Law Review. It was, it was several of us who were first years in law school, and we created a journal that still exists. And we were creating a, uh, uh, an advisory board. And so we said, OK, well, we want to have Mexican-Americans, we want to have Puerto Ricans, we want to have Cubans, we want to have Central Americans, we want to have Republicans, we want to have Democrats. So we had this little chart of like eight boxes. And this fairly cynical friend of mine looked at it, reached over, he crossed out Cuban Democrats and Puerto Rican Republicans and said, okay, we can do the rest of this. <laughs> I, you know, one of the things, and that's a bit of an oversimplification, but one of the things that I think is quite healthy for our community is that both parties are fighting over the Hispanic vote. Um, I don't think it is healthy for a community to be taken for granted by either party, and I think we are going to see in the years coming ahead each party trying to make the case that the policies they're advancing are going to make the biggest difference in our community, and I think that uh, is an overwhelmingly good thing. Representative Gallego, how do the parties then connect with the Hispanic community, and what are the lessons that we can learn from that as a, as a university to connect to the Hispanic community? Well, you know, I, I will tell you that Hispanics, I think, are already there uh, with respect to the issue of being aware. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about uh, decision making as an example, the Florida primary went to the Republican Party chose McCain, and they chose McCain because he won Florida, and he won Florida because of the Cubans. Um, so Hispanics are already there in terms of decision. How you connect with them, I think every candidate, it, it, it really uh, depends. I mean, I, I will tell you that the way not to connect with them is to threaten to put us all on a bus and send us home, um, and, and do that regardless of whether, uh, uh, you know, for me, some of, the, uh, some of the bills that I see in the legislature uh, are, pretty offensive. I mean, if you uh, see a car accident and the folks that you um, help get out of the car are non-citizens, then you're supposed to leave them on the side of the road and, you know, they don't get any ambulance and they don't get whatever. I mean, those things are, I mean, to me, the first thing that you have to do, I think, is acknowledge um, that everybody does whatever they do for their kids. The re I, I will tell you, I, I came to this recently. I mean, I've already admitted that I have one kid and he's four. And, and I, I, I have come to the conclusion, in all honesty, um, that I would do whatever I had to do to make sure that kid eats. If it means walk across the desert to find a better job, if it means, I mean, I, for the first time, I understand the sacrifices that my parents made. 
Every time I asked my parents for money, now I understand the sacrifices that my parents made. And the political parties have to understand that our families and our children and their future are just as important as anyone else's. That we're parents too, that we dream too, that we want a much better future for our kids just the way that every parent um, wants a better future for their kids. So this whole idea for me of separating us and showing us how we're different and how we're different from the rest of the country I think is the wrong way to connect. The right way for both parties to connect is to talk about those things that as Ted said that we have in common with the rest of the country which are in a very real sense our value system um, and our love for our families and our belief in the country and its future. And frankly, I think one of the most important things um, that we can all do is to acknowledge that it's OK um, to be proud of your culture and your heritage and yet still be an American. Because I am always amazed at how there's this huge controversy about whether we should print ballots, for example, in English and Spanish. Well, you know, Nicolás, who's bilingual at four, he can probably, he'll be able to read both languages. But our abuelas many times don't. And if you want your abuela to participate, and she's as much a US citizen as everybody else is, then why should she have to go and have an interpreter when she goes to vote? Why can't we just print the ballot in Spanish? For me, all of these little extraneous issues that serve to remind us, or that some, where somebody tries to remind us about how different we are, is absolutely the wrong way to connect. You tell somebody how important they are. I mean, if you think about um, when you were uh, dating the person that you're married to, did you tell them how important you were? Did you try to impress them? Or did you slap them around and tell them how no good they were? Um, <laughs> It is a very basic thing in building a relationship. It's just really common sense. And so I think both parties need to get better, better at it. I will tell you that when George W. Bush was governor of Texas, and he and I got along really, really well, and I was really worried because I would see the numbers and I would see how many Hispanics would say they were Republican. And I'm very thankful uh, that um, his uh, successors made sure that they did everything they could to put us back in the Democratic column, because that doesn't really happen anymore. A lot of it is immigration. A lot of it is some other issues. And I have to tell you that I wish, I, I, I have to agree with Ted that the Democratic Party isn't necessarily that good at reaching out at, uh, for Latino votes. It's just that the Republicans have been so bad at it. Uh, and so. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, we essentially win, uh, the Democrats win by default. Uh, and, you know, I'll take a victory where I can get it. Um, so uh, if that's the way we win, then that's the way we win. But um, I think how you do it, really, literally, is very basic. And, and, and it's, how you, it's how you develop a relationship. It's how you win over a friend. It's how you, it's, it's how you deal <coughs> just with everybody on a very regular basis. And there's no magic to it. I mean, it's just common sense. Well, let's end on a, on a positive note. I'm going to ask the panel. You've identified the challenges, the growing demographics. And so I'd like for each of you just to to tick off, in, in your opinion, what is the single greatest asset we have as a nation, a state, a university, a community that's going to get us there where we need to be, going to get us to the next level of leadership, going to get us to the next uh, level of achievement? And so, Chancellor, you get the, the first crack. Well, the greatest asset uh, either in our nation is still our educational system. It is challenged, uh, but we have the opportunity to make a remarkable difference. Uh, I think the other great asset is really, uh, as we've described today, um, you know, the wonderful values and, and uh, uh, principles that our Hispanic culture has given us. Uh, not only in what we've discussed today, but also in literature and in the performing arts, in music, uh, in so many wonderful ways. Uh, my, my one phrase of encouragement would be, or advice, uh, which is, and really what I've faced, is not to be intimidated by that road less traveled by. 
uh, because if we are first generation uh, college graduates, um, there are going to be decision trees uh, in the future where in fact, you know, failure might happen. And in many ways, uh, if you're going to enter into a position such as a congressman or a presidency of a health science center as chancellor, you can't fear that job. Uh, you really have to be able to state that you've got confidence, that you've been well educated, um, but don't be intimidated um, that you're the first uh, to be able to do something. Um, one does have to have a certain degree of courage uh, to be able to take these leadership roles in America and around the world. Uh, but if you were always scared that you might fail, you're never going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities uh, that are so bountiful still in this nation and in the world. I believe the greatest thing about our country that uh, Hispanics will embrace more in future generations is our nation's resilience. We are just a little over 200 years old, and when you stop and think about it, it's incredibly young compared to most civilizations in this world. And after 9-11, I can remember people walking up to me shaking in some cases, wondering, especially in the one or two days after that, are we going to be okay? Are we going to get through this? And I would remind them that this country has been through many challenges uh, over its lifetime, whether it was the Civil War that ripped this country apart, whether it was the Depression that started in 1929 that threatened families to their core, whether it was World War II that, that the, uh, uh, the enemies came close, close to really expanding their influence. And, but America came through with, the, with this incredible, uh, r the incredible resources that we had in our people and our allies to preserve what we have today. Then we had Vietnam. And we have had lesser challenges throughout our time and 9-11 hit us hard, and it's what we have all in this generation have experienced more directly. But our resilience, I believe, is why so many people around the world still see this country as the shining city on the hill. And it is what uh, many, uh, as we are getting back to what we are all here for today, where Hispanics all over the globe, uh, of course primarily in this hemisphere, want to be part of. And we should welcome them, we should embrace them, uh, to be part of what we all are fortunate to be part of. I, I very much agree that resilience is one of the key characteristics of, of Americans, and, and in fact, I think character is another way of describing that. But, but what I would characterize as our single greatest strength is the miracle of opportunity that this country embodies. There has been no country in the history of the world that has served the role the United States of America has served. And, you know, the Chancellor did a very good job at pointing out some of the challenges in education, and I think we have to pursue those challenges with an urgency to go and ensure that every child has hope and opportunity to really achieve the American dream. But at the same time, if you compare the United States to most other countries, if all of us were born in France, the condition of your parents or grandparents in France will determine your condition. It is by and large a static society in most countries in the world. If you happen to be fortunate and born into a landed estate, then you get to live well. And if you weren't born into a landed estate, then you get to serve those that were. What is extraordinary, what is unique about this nation is that we're not a static nation. It is an incredibly dynamic nation. All of us have personal stories. My own, my father came as an immigrant from Cuba in 1957. He showed up right here in Austin to go to the University of Texas. Didn't speak a word of English, had $100 sewn into his underwear. There's no nation in the world where someone coming with nothing consistently over and over again. Representative Gallego talking about his grandparents as, as migrant workers, and now their grandson is a state representative. That is an extraordinary nation where part of it is, no matter what the situation is today, it's not a static picture, it's a changing picture. You know, I've been traveling all over the state. I earlier this year announced as a candidate for attorney general. And so I'm actually out on the campaign stump talking all over the state. What is extraordinary, I find, is as challenging as the economy is right now, as much as people are worried about what's going on, 
across the nation and internationally, there is still an incredible hope and optimism all across Texas. In the Hispanic community and among Texans generally, a real belief that the resiliency, that the character of this country will overcome. Uh, and I think that, that ultimately is our greatest strength. <clears throat> Boy, it's, it's hard to follow that because I also think that this country is a country that each and every one of us can look in the mirror and say, this is a picture of the American dream. Each and every one of us, our children, our great-grandchildren, can look in the mirror and know that there is nothing that they can't overcome. There is nothing that they cannot accomplish. And it is because of love, and it is because of support, and it is because of their family and others. It could be a teacher, it could be a mentor, a Boy Scout leader, a, a, a tío, a tía somebody that is there for that child that can help them be make and become that American dream. I always say, I am that poster child for the American dream. Um, but one thing I, wanna, I wanted to, I have to ask this question before I pass the mic, and that is, you know, that President Obama will have an opportunity to make an appointment to the Supreme Court to re replace the retiring Justice uh, Souter. And I, I'd like to show by a raise of hand if you agree that it's important for President Obama to replace Justice Souter with a Hispanic. So then I'd ask, why is that important to this nation? And, and you know, and, and you answer that question, why is that important to you that President Obama replace him with a Hispanic? Is it because society expects it? That perhaps our, our highest court should ref reflect the population? Right, so I'll leave you with that. Well, I, um, you know, we'll add one other facet to the conversation, and, and that is, um, you know, the thing that I'm most excited about is, uh, is our potential. And it may be, um, you know, I, I, I uh, see Sherry Greenberg here, who I started with in the legislature not so many years ago. Sherry, I'd like to think that's not so long ago. Um, it's been 20 years, but it, 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 it wasn't, it's yesterday. I, uh, and I have to tell you that um, one of the things that I'm the most excited about is the potential and the, and the, the talent. Because I get to see, for example, I get to work with a lot of kids, uh, and I call them kids, uh, young adults maybe, who are in stu you know, school here at the University of Texas. Uh, and I see some really, really big dreamers and some folks that really, really have a lot of potential. And for me, that's important because one of the challenges uh, for the folks that are um, you know, I, I've never forgotten Paul Moreno, who served in the legislature for a long time, probably 30 or 40 years. Paul and I, Paul was, was so far to the left of me that he and I usually couldn't agree on lunch. But, um, <laughs> but the truth is that it was people like Paul Moreno who broke the doors down so that people like Pete Gallego could serve. And that was such an important lesson for me because you really had to uh, and, and in those days, there were so few role models. There were so few people who helped break the doors down and helped bring other people. And now you see uh, people uh, like uh, Dr. Cigarroa, who is an incredible role model for uh, <coughs> folks across the state, Latinos, non-Latinos, everybody. You see uh, folks like um, Henry Bonilla. I mean, truthfully, how many kids grow up in San Antonio uh, in a housing project and ever have aspirations of going to the U.S. Congress. Every lawyer's dream, every lawyer's dream, whether they admit it or not, in the back of their mind, <laughs> is to argue before the U.S. Supreme Court. And Ted Cruz, I mean, you, you think, I mean, for young folks out there, they have an opportunity to see, and for women, because truthfully, the Latino population um, includes, what, 51, 52 percent females. 
And like Orlinda Naranjo, what a role model because in terms of being able to jump any hurdle, any obstacle that life throws at you, it's Orlinda Naranjo. The truth is that we have more role models who are in place now than we've ever had before in our history as Latinos. And we have more, maybe it's just by sheer virtue of numbers, who knows, I've never thought about it that way. But we have more raw talent and more potential <coughs> out there than we've ever had before. And so there's more promise than we've ever had before. We're gonna be bigger contributors to the American dream than we've ever been. And it is said that a rising tide raises all boats. So when Latinos do well, it's not just Latinos that we're talking about. It's everybody. If Latinos prosper, and we've got some challenges. No, no Chancellor Cigaroa raised those issues very, very well. And those are not issues that we need to be looking to government programs to fix. Those are issues that we got to fix ourselves as a community. Those challenges, assuming that we can overcome those, just think of the potential and the talent and think of how cool tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and next year and the year after next will be. Think of those, I mean for me, frankly, the only reason that I do all of this and the only thing that I keep thinking about is that little four-year-old because I want him to have a much better life than I did. But I also know that statistically right now, He's going to be part, or actually I'm going to be part of the first generation of Texans that doesn't leave Texas better off than our fathers and mothers left it to us. Unless we make some fundamental decisions, some fundamental changes in where Texas is going, then our future doesn't look so bright. So it takes all of us working together. It takes all of us pushing, empujando de poco a poco to make sure that we get Texas where we want it to be. And I'm not talking about Latinos and non-Latinos. I'm not even talking about Democrats and Republicans. I'm talking about Texans and Americans because fundamentally it's a conversation that we all have to have together about the future of our country and where we want it to go and what we want it to do. And at the end of the day, I know that everybody, black, brown, yellow, green, purple, we all love our kids and we all want tomorrow to be better for them. So those are the things that we need to focus on, and those are the things that we need to work towards, and we need to make sure that we work with every community of color and not of color to make sure those dreams are accomplished. Please join me in thanking tonight's panel. <laughs> we really appreciate you taking the time to be here and your contribution. It's such a pleasure to be able to assemble such an outstanding group of leaders and role models. And so tonight, I'd like to turn it over to another leader, Susana Aleman, the chair of the Hispanic Alumni Steering Committee. Thank you, Ronnie. On behalf of the Texas Exit Hispanic Alumni Steering Committee, I want to thank everyone associated with tonight's event, especially Ronnie, Chancellor Cigaroa, all the panelists, Admiral Inman, and of course, all of you for attending. I also hope you will attend our next big event, which will be on Friday, September 25th, the night before the UTEP football game, a fiesta here. We'll play Loteria, among other things. The Longhorn <laughs> Band will be here, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it's traditionally, the event had been held the night before the first football game. But because of such the warm welcome we received in El Paso last year, we thought we'd have it before the UTEP game, even if they did have some signs that said, Vivo Tacos and Vivo Menudo. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what we can come up for those minors this year. Anyway, in addition to reminiscing about good times, our main focus that evening is to raise scholarship funds. Feel bad if, we the if you recall the Hopwood case <laughs> and a little history behind that, that the university was told that it could no longer give race-based scholarships. That applied to the schools and colleges, but not to the Texas Exes. So thanks to the Longs and the Jamels, they established a challenge fund that would match funds raised. Well, our Hispanic Alumni Steering Committee had the goal of raising $100,000 to be matched. Well, we only had a little bit over two years and we didn't do it. 
But thanks to the Texas Exes, they saved those matching funds for us. And this past year, we set as our goal that by the end of 2008, we wanted to reach our goal. Thanks to a generous contribution by Joe and Terry Long in December, we reached our goal. Our endowment now has $200,000. And that, the interest from that will go to scholarships for deserving Hispanic students. As you heard, education is the key. We do want to open the doors for every capable Hispanic student to come to UT. But we still need more money. Expenses are going up. So please open your hearts, your checkbooks. If you need any help writing out the check, please see me. I'm real good at writing zeros. <laughs> But thanks again for attending tonight. Please feel free to stay a little bit longer, socialize a little bit more, and drive home carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.